everybody, it's Tom from PC Gamer here with Tim Schaefer and Greg Rice from Double Fine playing Full Throttle Remastered. How you guys doing? Hello. Doing nice good. to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you here. So we're going to show off the, the first half hour or so of the game, talk to you about it. Tim, this was like... This game was like your baby, right? Back, back in the day. <laughs> you know, it's almost to the day. It's definitely to the month, like 22 years ago. Wow. That we made this game. It is, yeah, this is the first time I was out on my own running a project. I had done Day of the Tentacle with uh, Dave Grossman, and now I was just like doing this biker story <laughs> all by myself on the open road. Why the jump? It seems like a, a pretty a big thematic jump between the two. Yeah, it, 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 it seemed literally subtle at the time, but looking back, it was like this big leap. Um, just think they, uh, you know, after the Day of the Tentacle, they're like, well, come up with another game idea. And I was like, ah, what, what, what? And, you know, coming up with something from scratch is, is often hard. And just uh, in this case, the inspiration came from talking to friends and friends of friends and hearing about the, someone who had spent their summer with a, a bunch of bikers. And, and it just sounded like this crazy fantasy world that I had not seen really explored in games before. And, uh, you know, like both fantastic but also kind of grounded and, uh, and just a great thing to do. And also our inspiration were very visual, very um, cinematic. It was that it was the '90s, and we were watching liquid television, you know, and Aeon Flux, and you know, reading Hellboy comics, and all those things kind of fed into this look of, you know, big close-ups and, and action and and, uh, and full throttle. And so, so I guess just jump through like what's what's the remaster got in store? You know, you guys have re remastered the audio, you've redone all the art, all that sort of stuff. Is there new <coughs> junk in there? As well. New junk, <laughs> bunch of new junk in the trunk of this uh, game. We, uh, you know, we have a good relationship with Lucasfilm and and got to go to the ranch and go to the uh, the barn they call it, which is uh, not a barn at all, but like a really beautiful, humidity atmosphere controlled building where they archive things like the the original film that Star Wars was shot on and stuff. And then right in the middle of that is this flat file from LucasArts full of art from the old game. And we got to go up there and pull all the old original art out from Peter Chan and Larry Ahern and scan it all and put it in the game as, as a concept art browser. And you, just, you can see how closely the final game really mapped to some of these some of these original sketches and drawings. Um, and uh, So in a, in a way, now that, now that it's, you know, the technology has improved so much in 22 years, like you could get closer to that original vision and that original concept art than, than you could back when in the days yeah. of pixels. Yeah, yeah, because when I think when Peter drew those original drawings, he wasn't like, now what this needs is a stair-steppy sort of jaggy pixel. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he imagined it looking more like this. So that's the original game. You can see uh, with the, both the aspect ratio changes and also the resolution, obviously. And then here we go, fully wide, you know, the real panoramic shot. That's a great shot to <laughs> see how the difference is. We had to paint, you know, the artist had painted Let's more information on the side of the screen, which wasn't there before, and uh, they, uh, on all, there was 15, I think 15,000 frames uh, that were repainted for this game in character, individual character animations and also full screen cutscenes. And the bikes were all remodeled because they were not ar archived very well, the 3D models that we used for the bikes, because this was the first time we ever used 3D anything in the game. And um, those are all remodeled, and uh, they look beautiful. So that, so that's the, uh, the visuals we also, besides repainting them, and uh, we didn't change the animation or anything like that, but we repainted all the cells of the, the animation. So um, we also uh, went back to the uncompressed um, audio for voice because we didn't, you know, we didn't want to re record the voice because we couldn't. First of all, because uh, Roy Conrad, who plays Ben, had passed away. And, um, but his voice is so great. We went back and found the original uh, DAT tapes and wow. re-digitized, re-edited, um, re and uh, uncompressed the, the original source material. So his voice sounds even better, just more deeper and resonant. And then we went to Keith Karloff, who runs the, the leads of the Con Jackals, who does the song that you're hearing right now. And um, he let us have the reel-to-reel uh, -reel audio tapes, and we got to re-digitize those and, and, and remix them stereo, and you, hear, you can hear how much better that sounds. It's incredible to think that all that stuff survived that long. Well, it was on the edge. You know, I mean, like, yeah. there was a, a group of people at Lucasfilm who uh, f had to track down that flat file. Like, apparently it had been shipped off to some storage place in Oakland for a few years, but then it was found, and um, it was like a heroic internal effort to to save that, some of that stuff. But that those real to real tapes it wouldn't have lasted very long. I don't, you know, they don't last forever. And yeah. So getting that off and getting it scanned at a high resolution and... Um, it was really important, and that's one of the things about doing these remasters now that's felt kind of vital. Like, these, a lot of that stuff is going to get lost. Some people have already passed away. Some some information is going to get lost. 
but um, the original crew, for the most part, is still around and can still give context for not just um, how the game was made, but who, like who were the people who made this game at that time? And you know, we're all in our twenties and in Marin in the nineties. You know, it was a game that could only have been made, I think, then by those people. And you guys, you must be experts at the the remaster by now. This is what your third remaster of a, one of your classic adventure games. Yeah, it was we, Grim Fandango and, and Day of the Tentacle before this. Yeah, and, and Oliver uh, Franska, who did, is a lead programmer, he worked on the special edition of Monkey Island, which Lucas right. uh, did um, themselves, and he is uh, the person who had that technology where you just uh, crossfade, hey, you, you know, between the two here. versions. You know, this so he's done it even longer. But um, we d- we did a lot of it. Internally, and our friends at Shiny Shoe, a developer friend of ours, helped a lot with that. And um, and yeah, they're we have it down now. Is, is, there, is there any part of it that's gotten like I mean, I imagine a lot of it, but like, is there any one piece of it that's like Maybe way easier than when you guys first started doing stuff like this? Yeah. Well, I think some of the engine parts are there, but all the games are so different. It's really hard. Like, this game is so many more frames of animation and full motion video, very different than Day of the Tentacle. Yeah, you know, and so Grim Fandango is, of course, completely different because of its 3D engine. So they all have their own uh, interesting challenges, but I feel like some of the other Lucas games would fit in one of those three models, They'd, you know, be cl- similar to one of those. Because those games span the whole uh, era. Yeah. He rides with me. So, so I, I guess Although this I'm is going to sure be the first time a lot of people right are playing this game nowadays, right? Like, I told it, you to wait out in the do you think like uh, does full throttle still have like a place? You know, like is 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 it I, that that might be a mean question, but like is it, it? You know what I mean? Like is it is it still relevant in today's like fast paced world of Overwatch and CS:GO and nothing else? You know? Yeah, I think uh, I think the real modern thing that's happened in the last few years because of digital distribution and crowdfunding is that every different kind of game has its place mm. and has its audience and can find its audience. It used to be before. Uh, a big company would invest in whatever just the top one or two things was, and had to, you had to fit in one of those molds. And now, you know, ever since you know, when we did our crowdfunding campaign for an adventure game, we found that there's enough people that who wanted them that they could fund it. And so, um, you see that a lot with a lot. There's a lot more uh, variety in gameplay types because. Um, even though a genre might not be the biggest genre, there's still a lot of people who, who like it and want to play it. I think a lot of people don't know they would like adventure games because there's so many different uh, types of game and ways of playing and mentally, well, like, the headspace you're you're playing a game like this is a little more relaxed, like, you're because the game doesn't really move until you move. And you don't have to worry about, like, getting shot in the head or anything. You're you're kind of in a different space where you're exploring and you're open to trying new things and uh, solving puzzles. And uh, it's kind of a it's a a different zone to be in. And I think it's really uh, pleasant. And although a lot of things about adventure games have been taken over by other genres, like there's a lot of we used to have the best art and the best cinematics and, you know, best music in in, in the early days. Like we really focused on that. And then a lot of games have great music and visuals and everything like that. But I think that... That mental space that you're in when you're solving puzzles and exploring the story is still unique to adventure games. Mm-hmm. And so, so for those of us who were like me, four at the time it came out, um, give me a rundown. What's going on? Like, what's what's kind of the the the, the plot of the game? Uh, the game's about Ben Throttle, who's the leader of a biker gang known as the Polecats, and uh, he's on the run for a crime he didn't commit in this adventure, and he's trying to find out who actually committed the murder and f- get his gang out of jail. And uh, you get to you know uh, do things you do in adventure games using verbs on the screen to, to uh, interact with the environment, but also you get to ride your motorcycle, get into motorcycle combat, you use your chainsaw, your your um, Two by four on your other bikers on the road, and uh, and it's a hard, cold world out there, for <laughs> and you get to explore it. And we we talked about the kind of the the theme shift between something like Day of the Tentacle and this before, but are you punching through the walls right now? Is that what's going on? Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, but you start the game in a dumpster. It's unauspicious beginnings. Was this more of like when you guys were first making this? Was like I've woken up what was the was the attitude of making a game of like 
whether it was for like a kids thing or an adult exactly. thing, like was that different than making games now? Because this seems more like it's <coughs> not that it's like Everybody. explicit in any way, but you know it. No, it was. It was very deliberate. You know, some ways, and we like to do different things. I mean, and we like my lips on that. trying stuff like uh, Day of the Tentacle is very inspired by Chuck Jones cartoons, like mm-hmm. Duck Amuck or What's Opera Doc or great, you know, great um, Bugs Bunny cartoons of our childhood, and those are those are awesome. And but we we and we really like 2D art. We really like stylized art, but we wondered if um, does that have to be for kids? You know, is there is there a more adult look that you could have, but still have it be artistically interesting? And that's what I was talking about. Things like Aeon Flux that came out in that mm-hmm. era, and um, th- or Akira. There's obviously, if you look at Ben's bike, Some it's basically one of the bikes keys. from Akira. <laughs> and there's a, there were a lot of uh, influences like like that that you things you wouldn't call a kids movie, but they were very like adult stylized animated mm-hmm. features, and um, also movies like Road Warrior and Open Yo Jimbo. Up. As for the samurai movies, mm-hmm. you know, just they're all influences on this. But we we wanted to um, to do something that wasn't necessarily for young. We didn't look like it was for you know eight it's year olds. Shut. I prefer doors anyway. <laughs> and and it's it's interesting to hear the the influences for this game too, because then you know itself like Full Throttle itself has gone on to to influence uh, yeah. a lot of other games in in terms of style and and it kind of. Sticky. Uh, theme and that sort of stuff. Well, I don't want it, no trouble. Were you expecting, I guess, like mess. these early adventure games to be as influential as they were? Yeah, we never really thought about that kind of stuff, you know, in our because you know we weren't as plugged into yeah, the community or the box. world at large because there was mm-hmm. no real internet. Right. Because there's CompuServe and message boards, BBSs and stuff like that. But we were just like just talking to each other, and maybe we go to GDC, the early GDC, when we all fit in one hotel, and we could talk to like people <laughs> like at Sierra and stuff like. What are you guys working on? And, <laughs> and it was mostly just our own inspiration and our own feelings of what stories were untold in games. Like and where we always just wanted to go somewhere yeah, fresh, you know, because there's already even then at that gem, stage of the games industry, there had been a ton of high fantasy. And a ton of science fiction, and we were like, where, where else can we go? Like pirates, you know, know comedy. You know, that was that was really new back there for Secret of Monkey Island. You know, Chuck Jones cartoons are, are still kind of unexplored in, in games, I think. And then, uh, um, then this world of uh, it's, it's also not post-apocalyptic. There's been a lot of post-apocalyptic stuff, but people often think this is because it's so bleak and like lonely out in the road. But it's like, uh, but it's not. It's just a different alternate reality. Oh, look at those pixels. There's something warm and friendly about pixels. Yeah, the, <laughs> you you mentioned that the the tech originally was for the, the Monkey Island remasters, and it's I'm glad it's one of those things I'm really glad you guys kept through all of the remasters because it's a really like lovely and nostalgic thing to be able to just like very clearly side by side say oh this is how this looks now this is how it looked before because there's an aspect of this stuff of like. Probably a lot of the people that played this game in 1995 remember it looking like this. Yeah. Right? Like the, That's a weird thing. The brain fills in the gaps. You're competing with people's memories, not the old game. Yeah. Rand, Rand Miller, the designer of Mist, told me that, like, everyone constantly tells him that they they thought the clouds were moving in Mist. And he has to, like, remind people that, like, the cl- like the skybox was static. There, like, mm-hmm. weren't moving clouds. And people just fill in those gaps. Mm-hmm. And it meant a lot to me when I first played Monkey Island, the special edition that Lucas did. I was like, oh, I just want to play the old game. I don't want to play some special edition. <laughs> and so it was all there. I could play it exactly as it was, and that was nice. And then after, like, you know, five minutes of that, I was like, mm, maybe I'll <laughs> maybe I'll look at this nice. And you can see and you can see here, it's like a, it's almost like a, a, a trust or a comfort thing to be able to see the old game. Okay, it's there. They haven't messed with it, but then I want to now. I want to stop looking at those pixels. And I want. But some people, <laughs> people, people, some people want to play the entire way through in the old. And you can play the old audio. You can hear how it was all compressed. Like the, the, the sound was really cranked up really high for the old speakers to sound good. Uh, you can play with different combinations of interfaces and audio. Yeah, the uh, the I like that the subtitles are essentially unchanged though. The the different colored lettering, like mm-hmm. that big purple and the big green subtitles. That's how you know who's talking. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that was one of our things when we were wiring up a scene. We're like, what color would Daryl talk in? He's <laughs> kind of a yellow talker, I think. Hmm. You talk about this stuff too. There's oh yeah, there's all this the commentary stuff. There's. Um, we got the team back together, kind of the old, like a little mini reunion, and we watched the game together, and we told stories about um, 
uh, the development, and they remembered a lot of stuff I didn't remember. So mm. it was like amazing to get those those people together. So you can listen to all this commentary throughout the game. You can do the jukebox and listen to the music where we have remastered both, you know, Peter McConnell's uh, original um, score. We've you know found it's been reorchestrated with better samples and better you know. Um, Tech, but then also, like I mentioned, the Gone Jackals has been remixed from the original analog. Mm -hmm. So you can see you can switch it from lo fi to hi fi. It's cool that you could get those original files too and then kind of just touch them up as you need because, you know, fans fans of old games like this are so rabid that, like, if you change like the confirmation sound of a click thing, like, they'll they'll know, right? And they'll they'll be like, oh, the old one was so much better. Mm -hmm. hey, yeah, and the I only the only I solution to that instead of arguing about it is just give them both. Exactly, yeah. How much, uh, how much pressure was there? Because it's nice that there is both, but how much pressure was there to like get it right? You know, like how to to not kind of stray too far while you were recreating this stuff in, in higher fidelity. I mean, that was mostly our own desire. You know, we wanted to do that. We didn't want to. You know, we've seen seen some movies from our childhood, like E.T. and stuff, be changed in ways that we didn't like. You know, like taking out the guns, putting in the walkie talkies, and just don't want to. It feels like that breaks a little bit of the trust. I mean, I, I understand seeing something that you made years ago and wanting to like freshen it up or keep it keep it working, and that's really what we're doing. We're kind of taking care of these old games and keeping them working right, and fixing little problems with them. Um, but we don't. I feel like you change the meaning of something when you change too much. You, it seemed a little revisionist, you know, so we wanted to leave it the way it was. Was there anything that you, like, would have changed if you if like, if you now could remake this game, like, actually from scratch sort of thing? I think that's just, that's, unless you're actually doing that, it's hard to, um, oh, nice crash. Look at that. <laughs> <laughs> well done. I don't know if you really could pop a wheelie on a bike that heavy. That is a really It's pretty heavy back heavy, though. Yeah. It's got all the, the oh. pipes and stuff on the back. I just noticed it. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, all those pipes really help. That's probably what they are. They're just lead weights that he puts back there. <laughs> Yet he has no burn wounds. No burn wounds afterwards. I just realized that. Um, That's what you'd go back and change. Yeah, yeah. Was there anything I could change? I mean... No, I mean, there's mostly like, bugs and stuff. Like, there's some bugs that appeared... Oh, here's me talking. Over me talking. We need something so this is me and Larry Ahern talking about these scenes because he, I think he was talking about how he made the scene in a few hours. Uh, and so this is, this is the commentary track you, you turned yeah. on earlier? Cool. We had such a tiny team and we're going, the whole thing will be fully animated. It'll be crazy. Because if you look at it, not much is really animated. It's his legs. Where we had just three full screen animations. We were inspired a lot by uh, Out of This World or Another World. If you played that game from the... I don't think I have. We're going to have all these full animations. It, it, yeah, it, 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 the gameplay of it was more of a side-scrolling um, uh, exploration type game, but you, the opening was very stylized and very lo-fi in a way, like very, um, very simple polygons. But um, they they use this kind of like French style to make it look really like still really evocative. And the guy gets in the elevator, and you just see this little crack of light moving up. That's the whole screen is this crack of light, and they, but you know, like oh, it's the elevator, it's really cool. <laughs> and we were inspired by that to like have these scenes where like not a lot of actual like character animation is happening but we're telling the story like here we in this case using effects you know what are you i mean there are a couple scenes in the game where ben does incredible acrobatics and stuff like that and here's maureen you can see a little bit of her tattoo that's foreshadowing you guys tattoos <laughs> and uh, you you've mentioned like my bike as inspirations like movies and film a couple times now like different different ones as well um, what I did with you. How much of these early adventure games stuff. was like trying to recreate that sort of stuff? I mean, we, we weren't we weren't trying to make uh, movies. We were really sensitive to that because when we play test things like Monkey Island. We learned that you know watching someone play a point and click adventure, if you have like three lines of dialogue in a row without a break, people are tapping their fingers on the mouse. They're kind of like, I want to play again. Like, so ever we've always had this tension of like how, taking away control for the player very as little as we possibly can. So. Um, uh, we're always, you know, really aware of them as being games and, and, and not movies, but I we were very inspired by, you know, reaching for some action. of the same emotional highs and lows that movies went for. Because in, yeah, in a movie like Kujimbo or, or, or Road Warrior, they have these moments that are just so incredible, and it's like, oh, I wish oh, if we could achieve that in a game, or something as exciting as the final truck combat scene in Road Warrior, or like um, the mood of, you know, Toshiro Mifune sitting in a, you know, drinking sake in a bar and just... Um, 
scratching his collarbone. <laughs> Harder to capture, I imagine, and with the like the limited pixels and the limited graphics. Yeah, it's all in the eyes. It's all in the yeah. eyes. I mean, in a certain way, what you were talking about of not having too much character animation is like it, it's beneficial because you you once again you just let the player fill in the gaps, right? You let them mm -hmm. fill the motion in themselves. Mm -hmm. And the sound effects sometimes will, will, will help a lot with that. Mm -hmm. Wow, look at those pixels. Sometimes you forget how few pixels her face was. Yeah, it's like maybe two for the eyes, just mm -hmm. in kind of straight lines, and that's it. Mm -hmm. But you guys had more... Um, like you, you said, you referred back to like design documents and like yeah, concept her art face right there. The details no, come from the concept art. Yeah, yeah. we have yeah. you know nice line drawings of her face from the concept art and kind of close-ups that we can There's use to, an ambush. to ambush. make that f ambush. nice version of her face now. Nice. And Maureen was a fun character because it was the one that taught me like how to do. In some ways, I learned a lot about uh, support characters and how mm. a character like Maureen could be really boring because she's just there to fix your bike and she's like a she could just be a plot device. But I remember thinking about, well, she's got to come back later, and so what, what kind of mental state would she be in? And I made this whole chart for what she was doing the whole game. Like, in each scene, Ben's doing this, Ben's doing this. Even though you don't see Maureen, what is she doing? Like, well, here's where she must have found out about this happening, so she could be really mad. So she's probably going off to do this. And then, so when you see her, she's hopefully been through, you feel like she's been through a bunch of different states. You know what I mean? So, and I think that's really important and um in character design and writing and games or anything, you know, is you can you have a lot of support characters and you don't want them to seem like generic support characters. So you've got to really think about, almost think about the whole game from their perspective sure. and what they're thinking. My gang's involved. So even beyond the concept art that we, we were just flipping through, like, there's a lot that you guys didn't put into the game but but made, right? Like story, this backstory, this what other people were doing mm -hmm. off camera, all that stuff is... Mm -hmm. Somewhere, even if it was just in your head at the time, like that. How, how I guess, how important is that in like how much of that stuff do we end up seeing come out in the game? You know, uh, you know, uh, I feel like it's important not to show some of that stuff because if you show just too much of it, it's like this one-to-one -one relationship where you like the player just feels like they've seen. Okay, I saw everything they made. That's the end of that world. But I see it more as like if you do if you did a painting and then you can only look through it through like a slats and a fence, you kind of get this like you know like you just imagine there's a lot even more you know you see like a couple of glimpses of something, and you fill in the gaps but you fill them in with your own imagination which is always going to be more interesting. I don't have any money to pay you with. Hey, this one's free. I haven't touched it. That grizzly voice is. I'm I'm really glad you guys you know kept it in there as as is and and both of them yeah yeah ben, uh, Roy Conrad. It's not. It's a nice well, voice because it's like you get back it's to gentle work. too. I mean, like it's it's tough. It's deep and it's low, but it's very gentle. And and Kath Susie, who does Maureen, has a very distinctive voice too. That you um, she does a lot of animated anything. features, and she's in Brutal Legend and uh, as uh, as Lita. Who's this? Yeah, this game. Uh, I was gonna bring up Brutal Legend because this game seems very much like a like a, a precursor in in ways, not of course directly, but stylistically at least in in some regards. Yeah, because then Disney would own Brutal Legend. <laughs> um, no, it's uh, it definitely comes from you know a place uh, where I love hot rods. I love uh, you know things with pipes on them, <laughs> things with loud engines and pipes and. Um, uh, and also the Road Warrior and, and um, those kind of inspirations. I just always like those like those kind of stories. So there is like a link between those, and also has heavy metal, which I've always been. A, it's always been a favorite genre of music for me. So I think um, that's not a secret at this point. <laughs> I'm trying to keep that on the down low. Though, yeah, so. <laughs> you heard it here first. Tim Shaver <laughs> likes metal. Um, yeah, I, and. Part like I just part of that is it's life. it's really yeah, I mean I, I keep coming back to it but it really is like I, I can't think of nice other games like many you know? other games that have that that metal theme or that kind of like that pipes the everywhere the theme the as it were you know? <laughs> uh, especially this early well like the movie Heavy Metal you ever seen that. I actually have outrageous, haven't. outrageous, just just that ridiculous kind of animation from the '80s and '90s. Mm -hmm. You know, that's stuff I grew up on. I and you know, exactly. it doesn't really matter. It's not like I think all games should be metal. Or, you know, that'd be cool. <laughs> but but um, the main point is, I feel like I, well, I like the, the idea of games being personal statements, and not just of one person, but of a team. You know, that, they, that well, like I was saying, this game could only have been made of right, by us at now. Lucas at that time in that location. You know, and who we were then. How and many people were on the team at that time? 
I mean, the team was not huge. Less than, fewer than 20 people. Hmm. Which I think we had like three programmers and then three and four, five. And it just got pretty big with a 3D artist. And yeah, so maybe about 20, 20 people. It's but um, uh, I, mean, I feel like that's something I'd like to see all games be just to have a real personal stamp on them, no matter what company they came from. So they, like, that is definitely a game that only can, only can be made by that, that, that group. Mm-hmm. Is it. Uh, is it strange to see people like, like, t- to see modern day indie kind of small one two man teams making these adventure games that kind of that that rival what Full Throttle was at the time, you know, with a tenth of the manpower that you guys had at the time. I mean, obviously, tons has changed since then. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know how they do it. Yeah, they just. Uh... Obviously, work much harder than we did. Super lazy. <laughs> That's the only answer. <laughs> Either someone's doing some welding down there, or we're talking about some very. How long did it take body. you guys to like? How, how about how long was the process for this? I want to say this glass. was a year and a half. I mean, we shipped Dot uh, Data Steve Tentacle in '93. This came out in '95. So with some pickup and downtime, I think that still was about a year and a half. And then. Compar- to, comparatively, like, like how long to, to remaster it? Do you know? Yeah, it was about a year and a half. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we touched every pixel. Right. In some ways, it would have been faster to record new music than remaster new music, huh. you know? So, and the research and just the, re- you know, coordinating with the old team and, and stuff. Yeah. But, uh, Day of the Tentacle would have been early last year. Yeah. So, a little over a year. Mm-hmm. But it's interesting, yeah. I mean, I haven't really compared the budget of remastering Grimm, but Grimm actually it did better. Like, it actually sold more in this remastered version than in the original version. So uh, everything's everything's gone up. Well, that was something similar that when you guys uh, when you started the Psychonauts two campaign, you were saying that Psychonauts one sold more in its second five years than its first five years, right? I mean, everything in the game industry to me is all about the long haul. Maybe I just as, <laughs> a, as an old person, but me. you know, there's a lot of things that don't they don't pay off right away. Like especially shipping an indie game these days. You know, it's like the, you know the, you don't often not everybody, very few people get that huge launch, like the big explosive launch that that catapults you into immediate riches. I they can't all be Stardew Valley. Valley. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, some of them just they build slowly over word of mouth, and you have this back catalog of games that. Um, uh, people, f- you know, find out about and keep buying, and so that's definitely was the case with Psychonauts. Grim, I mean, Throttle. This was actually a, a really relatively really big hit for the adventure games back then. You know, mm. we, um, it, it, it's you know sold. I feel like it sold more than twice than Dot did. I nominate that as and that's all, of course, of, because of the number of explosions on the box. Is how I count that. <laughs> Explosions and motorcycles jumping on the box. Surprise! The next game you guys made just didn't like cut this one big explosion for the box. I never learned my lesson. I never like, oh, that's right, more explosions. Well, now you have a chance. The remaster. Just change the box art to one big explosion. This room is scarier than the remaster. It's darker. Oh no! It was always a scary room. And they also don't collect whatever that is. It's it's really interesting. The art is so like. Dark goes so seamlessly, but it's really interesting to hear the fidelity of the audio change as well. Because it's, it's again, it's just one of those things where you don't think about it. Like, you don't notice it when you're just looking or just listening to the old game. And then you swap over, and it's really a lot better. I learned, I got an achievement. Good job. I learned from the commentary, doing the commentary with the audio team. They are talking about how we, um, the more lo-fi they went in the old version, the better. Like, the more they just... Because it was all coming out of these, you know, old-fashioned speakers you'd have on your PC in the '90s, which were really crummy little speakers, and um, they would just turn the music up to it was distorted, and that's what made it sound more rock and roll to them. And so <laughs> you can hear that version; you can see how how wall of sound, like loud it was, wall of loud it was in the old version, and now it's a little more nuanced in this mix. But we're also trying like a different. This is an example I always give of the different kind of puzzles we had in this game. You know, the what old, you, you know, Monkey Island, and and. Even did the tentacle. A lot of the puzzle, um, a lot of the puzzles Open were puzzles up, because your inventory was so big, and you'd have thirty things in your pocket, and you'd be like, "What Open item up, do I use on this thing? Like, how do I put these items together?" It was a lot of item inventory management, and I, I remember there was a feeling like, "Let's, let's try to not do that. Let's try and figure out a different way to do puzzles that aren't about you know." For throttle, we're like, "What if you could only hold like six things?" 
and you had to figure out how to use things in context in the right time or in, in the right way. And so this puzzle is one where you, I think you use one inventory item, but it's really more about doing one kind of counterintuitive um, thing. Did you kick the door? Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's still my favorite. Okay. <laughs> Oh, you mean from the chain? Yeah, from the chain. <laughs> yeah. Open up, Todd. <laughs> yeah, I definitely still have fond memories of... I, I'd call them fond memories of coming to a like a locked door or a, a obstacle in my path in Monkey Island and just clicking everything in my inventory like to that thing until yeah. something worked, right? Mm-hmm. There's some things we did, like you've seen a couple times you highlighted the hot objects. What's the key for that on the PC? Uh, shift. So if you shift, you can see, um, hmm. which we didn't have in the old one. Some people might think that's cheating, but I think that, that really helps with pixel hunting problems. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of times, a lot of people don't know that, wait, do that again. Shift. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. You might you might not know that you can interact with certain things, and, and, and there was pixel hunting. Uh, it's mostly usually an accident. People think it's a design thing, but you... You mostly just, you know, the art's drawn small, and you tag the part that's the thing, and um, so that highlighting, I think, helps if you're really stuck, and you just don't, you think you've interacted with everything, you turn that on, you're like, oh, I didn't interact with that door. So, so one of the last questions I have is, uh, Tough looking padlock. The, with these remasters, like, I couldn't break that who, like, what, what made you want to, like, start going through this stuff was it is remastering these games like for you you know is it is it preserving <laughs> these old things or <coughs> well we um a lot of these games you can't play anymore mm-hmm. like uh, Graham you just couldn't buy anywhere you couldn't you couldn't legally play them you'd have to you know, torrent them and then like um, find an emulator to play them we wanted to make it so that you could you know it, it would be much easier for people to find them and play them and the audience themselves, the community has actually done a really great job making things like Scum VM and emulators and keeping uh, keeping old games alive. But the, I, I felt like they couldn't do one thing that we could do, which is tell the story of you know the making of the game and provide the context, the creative context for what we were trying to do back then, and and the things that like the concept art and the re- they they can't remaster the music from the originals, they, and they don't know where are all the um, concept art is hidden, you know. And so that's something we can do, and we can do at this time before it's all lost forever. And um, so it became a little bit of a mission, and it just felt like taking care of something that we had made before, you know, like if if you built a statue and put it in a public place, and then it needed a new coat of paint, and you'd just be like, oh, I should really take care of that thing because. <laughs> We put a lot of work into that and keep want to keep it looking nice. Well, I think that's about all the time we've got right now. Uh, when can people expect to get their hands on Full Throttle Remastered? Soon. Tuesday? Next Tuesday, 18th. April 18th. There we go. Well, thanks very much for joining us and awesome. telling me some stories about the game. Yeah, thanks for having us. And stay tuned at PCGamer.com for more coverage of Full Throttle Remastered. Boom, boom.